Can we stand together and we're going to turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. And we're going to go into the New Testament as well, so I'll give you a heads up. We won't turn there just yet, but Philippians chapter 2 is where we're heading to next, all right? So in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. See, it's important what the Lord has called us to in this walk of faith can only be accomplished by the Spirit of God who He has put within us so that we can obey His commands. And we have power to walk according to the Spirit. Let's go ahead to Philippians chapter 2, New Testament. A passage of Scripture that is really quite familiar, but um, I want to make sure that we understand the context in which Paul is speaking this. Philippians chapter 2, let's look at verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Church, this is the very word of God. Lord, as we spend this next little while together, I pray that you would lead us to understand the truth of your word, and that we would know the power to walk in the Spirit, to live by the Spirit. For your name's sake, amen. Amen. You may be seated. New Covenant Christian, we're looking tonight is at what does it mean to serve? How do we serve as a Christian? Ezekiel chapter 36 shows us that we can't do things in our own strength. That he takes a heart of stone and he gives us a heart of flesh. So in this element... Uh, we've all heard this passage of Scripture in Philippians about Jesus' name above every other name. But m many, many times, probably more often than not, it's taken in that passage alone so that the focus is set only on the supremacy of Jesus. That's fantastic, and that's what Paul is speaking about here is the supremacy of Christ. But in the supremacy of Christ... He's also using it as an illustration for you and me in our lives today. So did you notice what we see when we pick it up in verse 5? He says, have this mind among yourselves. I lost my place now. Which is yours in Christ Jesus. So in other words, have the same attitude, have the same mind that Jesus had. Now, you and I are not as magnificent and wonderful as Jesus is, to be sure. But look what Jesus, his mindset was. Although he was God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, meaning that it wasn't something that he taunted, that he, or excuse me, that he flaunted around. He didn't go from one place to another and says, I'm God, so listen to me. All right? He showed that he was God by the authority with which he lived. To appreciate what Paul is speaking about here, we need to back up just a couple of verses, all right? So here's what Paul begins to speak to us in chapter 2. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind 
having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So, working together, living together is what he's speaking about. If our faith is in Jesus Christ, then this is the way we ought to live. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Rather, everything we do is to be in humility, counting others more significant than ourselves. And that's not an easy thing to do. When we come into the world, we are all about ourselves. We don't care the timing or the inconvenience. We want what we want, when we want it, and we want it now, right? We all know what it's like when we've all had children or uh, when we've had, uh, been around people with infants. They don't care about anyone else. And it takes the work of the Spirit to change that even as that child grows into an adult. Because apart from the work of the Spirit, we're all selfish. We all walk in selfish ambition seeking our own benefit and our own good many times at the expense of others. But Paul is telling us here, don't do anything out of selfish ambition. Don't do it with conceit. In other words, making ourselves more than what we are, considering ourselves to be greater than who or what we are. Many times people think, well, I deserve this. I deserve better than what I have, and so that they will help themselves to what belong to other people. He says, in humility, consider yourselves, excuse me, count others more significant than yourselves. So just as difficult as it is to do nothing out of selfish ambition, it's also difficult to consider others better than ourselves. It can't be done for a prolonged period of time if we're only doing it in our own strength because we will grow tired. We're weak in and of ourselves to do that. So here's what he says. Look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And not just to the people that you like, but also to the people that can give you a hard time. They could be making things difficult for you. Look to the interests of others. And then he uses Jesus as the illustration for us. When he says, so, have this mind, think the same way that Jesus thought. That even though you think you, you may be owed something or you deserve something more than what you are receiving right now, that don't do anything that's going to put anyone else down or that's going to advance yourself at the expense of others. And then he uses Jesus saying, although he was God, he didn't come down to say, here I am, I'm God, bow down to me. He came as a man. He humbled himself and became a man, took on the form of a man. How much more humbling can you get than the God of creation, the most magnificent, mag majestic there is no one greater, there's no one higher. Yet in all of his splendor and his majesty, he took on the form of a servant, you and me, humankind. That's humbling himself. He didn't need to do that, but he did it because of his love for us, and he considered our interests greater than his own, in a sense. Not only did he humble himself and became a servant, but he became obedient to death. Not only death, but death on the cross. See, do you see that God is the author of life? He is the author of creation. Yet, by humbling himself and becoming a man, the greatest demonstration of a servant there ever was. And not only that, but he subjected himself to death. It's really mind-blowing when you stop to give some serious consideration to that. And if that was not bad enough, 
He humbled himself, became obedient to death, and death on a cross, the most humiliating, demeaning form of death. And he did it for you and me. But God has exalted him and given him the name that is above every other name. See, the Word of God tells us that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so James tells us, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand, and in due time he will lift you up. He will exalt you. So it's not about us exalting ourselves, is it? It's all about living for the glory of God and for the benefit of others. That's what it means to live as a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not about me anymore. It's all about Jesus. So I live my life to glorify Him and to benefit other people. So with that, I want us to go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. The greatest example, apart from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, that Jesus set before us. It was the night before Jesus went to the cross, showing him the full extent, showing his disciples the full extent of his love now, sharing a meal with them. They're, they're reclined around the table. And at the end of one of the tables is a wash basin. And it's placed at the, the position of the person who's seated at the lowest place at the table. So this was a place that the person who was sitting there, it was their responsibility to wash everyone else's feet. I don't know about you, but uh, I can see myself as a servant. As people come in, I could offer them a wash basin and help them wash their hands. I would be okay with that. But people coming in to a gathering, a meal, and it's hot like today, um, if we're in sandals and we've walked here, it's dusty and dirty roads. Furthermore, um, the roads would have been with all kinds of animals. So it doesn't take much to the imagination to get an idea of what this was like. And then to have to humble yourself, which means getting down to the position where the feet are. Lowing yourself and then washing those feet. That's the position of a servant. But nobody did it. And it's through looking at this, it appears as though Peter is the one who's at that seat to whom it, this responsibility fell. But he did not wash anyone else's feet. Well, when supper was over, Jesus got up. We see here in verse, uh, verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, that he was going... Uh, they had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper he, lay, supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you don't understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. Verse 12, When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am so. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. In that room that night, Jesus would have been the last person you'd expect to be the one washing feet. He would be the one that you expect to be the most deserving to have his feet washed 
by someone else, for him to be served. But that wasn't the case. Jesus said, I am your Lord and teacher, and if I, as your Lord and teacher, do this for you, then you also ought to do the same for others. And it doesn't mean that we need to go around with a, uh, a pitcher of water and a towel and go looking for people whose feet need to be washed. It's not what Jesus is speaking about here. Here, let me help you take your shoes off. Come here, sit down now. It's about serving others. This is what Jesus was speaking about. He wasn't talking about literally making sure you go regularly washing people's feet. He's talking about, as I have served you, humbled myself, and I've put you ahead of myself, your interests ahead of my own. So I want you to do for others. There's a couple of individuals in the Old Testament I want to consider just for a moment. One is in the book of Genesis, chapter 37. Here's a young man. His name is Joseph. He's 17 years old, and God has given him dreams. Not just things that he's dreaming of, and these are things I hope that will come to pass. These were, were God dreams. And one of the dreams he has, we see it in the first several verses here up until the end of verse 11. There's two dreams that, that Joseph shares with his brothers. He's, he's one of twelve brothers. He said, I had a dream, and in this dream, all, all of us had our sheaves, and, and your sheaves, every one of them, bowed down to mine, sheaf of, of wheat. And then they're upset and say, are you indeed going to reign over us? See, God was planting something in Joseph's heart, saying, I'm, I've got a destiny for you, I want, I've got something in your future, and you're going to be in a position of leadership. And he shares, the Lord shows him that by means of a dream, and he ends up sharing it with his brothers. Then the Lord gives him yet another dream. We see that in verse 9. Behold, I have dreamed another dream. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed Come to bow ourselves to the ground before you. So the Lord was showing it at least twice. And when God does something once, we know that that's his word. We know that he's going to do something. If he does something twice, he's saying that this is, a, is being established. I want you to know this is something that's firm. So in showing Joseph these two times, he's saying this is something I'm going to do in your life. Maybe he used some poor judgment in sharing it prematurely with his family. Perhaps he should have kept it to himself and discussed it with his father in private or something like that. Nevertheless, this is how it worked out. And it didn't change God's plan for him. Well, his brothers, they hated him. And so they decided at one point to take action against him. They put him in a, a, a dry cistern or well when he came to them to check up on how they're making out with the flocks. When they'd see him in the distance, they said, let's do something. Here comes that dreamer. They put him in this dry cistern, and then they were determining, they were thinking they were going to kill, the, kill him. Ultimately, some Ishmaelite traders came along, and they decided they're going to sell Joseph to them. And that's what they did. And they took Joseph down to Egypt, and there he was sold. He was sold to the captain of the guard of Pharaoh's household, to a man named Potiphar. But I want you to notice something. In chapter 39, Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had, brought, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and made him overseer of all his house, and put him in charge of all that he had. The Lord was blessing Joseph. The tables seemed to be turned upon him as Potiphar's wife 
cast her gaze upon him and she desired to have him intimately. When Joseph refused, she framed him as though he tried to assault her and to come upon her. As a result, Potiphar's hands were tied and so he had him sent to prison. Now, you need to notice what's going on here. Joseph, as far as he has seen and understands at this point, he's destined for greatness, for leadership, isn't he? This is the Word of God. And so he could have had an attitude, this is, is not right, it's unjust, it's not fair, I don't deserve this. And so he could have had a really rotten attitude and decided, I'm, I'm just going to wait here. I'm not, I'm not serving in any, any Egyptian house let alone this idolater. I'm not going to serve this man. So he may have suffered the beatings as he would, might have sat along and said, I'll wait for God to put me in the place of greatness that he had shown to me. But what did he determine that he was going to do? Wherever God had him, he was going to serve him. And he was going to serve him with integrity and trusting the Lord that he was going to lead him and give him what he needs so that he would serve the best wherever it was that he was planted. And that's what he did. And we read, and the Lord his God was with him. And he succeeded in everything that he did. He's a servant. But even as that, when he comes into the house of Potiphar, he's, he would have been one of the lowest servants in the house. But as he proved himself faithful and a person of integrity and putting others' interests ahead of his own, that he was elevated to the chief servant in all of Potiphar's household. Then when he's thrown into prison, you'd think perhaps just the way the heart goes about, I don't deserve this. This isn't, this isn't fair. God, what are you doing here? But God does a work even while he's in prison so that the uh, prison official puts Joseph in charge of everything so that there was nothing that this prison official needed to give consideration to. Look at verse 22. The keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. It would be 13 years before he would come to the position that the Lord had spoke to him when he was 17 years old. It's a long time to wait for the word of the Lord to come to pass. But God doesn't intend for us to wait for leadership to be brought about in our lives for us to just sit around twiddling our thumbs and looking to be brought to us on a silver platter. He says, I want you to serve me and be faithful where I have you planted because of what I've put before you is for the purpose of shaping you into the person, into the man or the woman that I want you to be that will most clearly reflect my glory. We see the same thing with David in 1 Samuel chapter 16. He's just a young teen. God has rejected Saul as the king. And now he's, David is anointed to be the, success, the succeeding king. But what we read in chapter 16 is that Saul needs somebody to minister to him on a musical instrument. To worship before the Lord because the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and now a, an evil spirit has come to torment him. David is summoned. Come to my palace and minister to me on your harp. And he did. Here David is the anointed king. And what is he doing? He's serving. He's serving. And he'll be doing this for just a little bit longer than Joseph was in his position of serving and serving before he came to his position of leadership. Can we come back one more time to the New Testament? Back to Philippians chapter 2 as we wrap this up. We are to have the same mindset as Jesus. Jesus was great. But he didn't put his greatness out there to be in our faces and say, this is what I deserve. Jesus had spoken about 
the, the Gentiles. They lord it over those who are under them. They, they rub it in their faces, as it were, and say, come and serve me. They make them do what they need to do. He says, that's not the way you are to live. Not in my kingdom. He says that you are to serve. Even as I, the Son of Man, has come not to be served, but to serve. And I've come to give my life as a ransom for many. And this is what Paul then picks up in this context in Philippians chapter 2. We were not doing anything out of selfish ambition, considering others greater than ourselves, putting other people's interests above ourselves. Now let's see what's on the other end of that bookend. So we've got one bookend just before, uh, in, in verses 2 and through 4. Before it speaks about the greatness of Jesus and how he demonstrated a servant lifestyle. The other end of that bookend is this in, in verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him. And he's going to describe what Timothy is like. He wants to send Timothy to the church in Philippi so that they would benefit from his character. Look what we see here. I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests. Other people, they are seeking their own interests. I have no one like Timothy. There are others who will do what Timothy does in a similar way, but Timothy... He does it in a way, exemplifies it in a greater way than anyone else that I've had the pleasure of being in relationship with. They all seek their own interests instead of the interests of Jesus Christ. Serving as a Christian doesn't mean how, am I, how do I serve in the church, in the church building, although that can be part of it. Serving is not categorized to a certain time or a certain place where we're gathered together in a place of worship like this or looking after a building like this for the, that we have set aside for the purpose of worship, gathering to study the Word of God. It's not compartmentalized. It's the way we're to live our lives day in and day out. And not just for those who are brothers and sisters, not just for those who we like or who are nice to us in return or who are nice to us before we have a chance to be nice to them. Those are easy, relatively easy. It, it sort of inspires us that, yes, I'd like to be nice to them and put their interests above my own. But even then, we need to be careful for selfish ambitions. But what Jesus is speaking about here is from the lowest and the hardest to love in our lives. That we're to humble ourselves and to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. Not for salvation, but where we would take up our cross daily, deny ourselves, and follow Jesus. So that the interest of Jesus Christ would be put first and foremost in everything that we say and we do, that it would be for the glory of God and for the benefit of others. The hard things and the easy things. And not determining that we're going to do it because I've, I, I know that I can put my mind to this and make it happen. We'll become exhausted, discouraged, and defeated. But when we say, Lord, this is something that I absolutely can't do in my own strength. I may succeed for a short time, but sure as anything, I'm going to fall flat in my face and I am going to have grudges or, or um, attitudes against those that I was trying to serve. Perhaps they hurt me or offended me or made it difficult or didn't appreciate what it was that I did. Even when we don't receive thanks, Jesus says, continue to give yourself. Give yourself away. Jesus didn't die just for those who loved him. He died for everyone on the planet. 
that were alive when he went to the cross and those who would yet be born. That's you and me. For when we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us when we were ungodly. So he shows us that by his Spirit, he takes away the heart of stone and he gives us a heart of flesh to be able to follow the commands of the Spirit of God that we would love as Jesus has loved us. That we would lay down our lives and we would walk in humility by the grace of God and by the power of the Spirit who lives within us. That's what it means to serve. And apply it to any and every situation that you're faced with. Whether it be family relations, work relations, interactions with people that you, you don't or barely know, whatever it is, Lord, how can I be a servant to you and to people that I'm going to encounter today with everything that I say and do? That's what it is to serve God. If Jesus were here physically, every one of us would aspire for an opportunity to serve him in whatever way possible, even in the most menial tasks, even if it wasn't recognized or acknowledged, if we could just do something for Jesus, we would consider such a privilege, wouldn't we? And if we were to look at others, saying, I'm doing this as unto the Lord, for whoever the individual is or the group of people is, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see with eyes like that. And we serve you and we serve others. When we elevate others ahead of ourselves, prefer them above our own interests, with genuine concern, we're really looking to the interests of Jesus. Lord, help us in a culture that's saturated with me first, with, with self, promotion, and self-preservation, self-comfort. That we would not get caught up in those things and end up neglecting the weightier measures, the weightier things in life. God, we want to lift you high. We want to serve you with humility. Help us with attitudes of the flesh that rise up in us and they pro it protests against the things of the Spirit. Lord, may we be yielded to you. Lord, take our tongues. The most difficult member of our bodies to tame, as James tells us. That we would use it for your glory, that we would surrender it to you. Lord, sanctify our tongues, our lips, that we would only speak those things that give honor to you and build others up. that we would be willing to be inconvenienced for your kingdom purposes.